Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. It was a technological marvel. The grid takes all those things unique to you, your social security number, your passport, your debit and credit accounts, and links them to one thing, your DNA. With just a touch, the grid collects a tiny sample of your genetic material, IDing you instantly. Greg Bruce. Then a purchase can be deducted directly from your personal accounts, or you can unlock and start your car. Sid Batista. And it all works within a margin of error of 0.001%. The ultimate social network. No cash has to change hands. No ID cards have to be shown. No keys have to be carried. Today, you can't do anything in New York City without the grid knowing who you are and where you are. Julia Richards. After just six months in service, the state legislature passed an unprecedented bill giving law enforcement complete access to the grid's data. To frame rate episode 106. I'm Tom Merritt. Howdy, folks. I'm Brian Brushwood. And that uh, that little thing that I was playing, like I, I was looking at it before, that's Plurality by Dennis Liu. And it dropped like two months ago on his YouTube channel. It's only like at a quarter million views. And when I was playing it, my brother walked into the room. And he says, what, what's this? What, what is this movie? And I was like, uh, this was made for $20 and a taco by this guy on YouTube. And it sets up this awesome... Band budget for a taco? Well, I mean, I assume so. They had to eat somehow, right? But I, they, want, I want that taco, by the way. <laughs> like, that's a good, a good taco. taco. <laughs> yeah, I should introduce. This is my brother. He's a uh, 3D model and animator over at uh, Sony Online. They just dropped their uh, big game, uh, Planet Side 2. That, uh, that seems to be doing extremely well. Uh, free to play, right, Jay? Yeah, free to yeah. play. So anyway, Jay thought it would be fun to kind of sit in studio as you and oh, I do absolutely. our thing. Absolutely, that's Tom. awesome. Yeah. He's a 3D modeler. Not an actual 3D model, right? Actually, I'm a 3D animator. 3D oh, animator, I, okay. Yeah. When you it said he's like, a 3D model, I was like, wow, he's really good. He looks like a real well, person. It's like the, uh, the Prodigy song. I'm a twisted animator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, good. Uh, more brushwoods, the better. That's what I always say. Uh, oh, that's your first mistake, Tom. Yeah, that's, 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 that's why I haven't gotten very far. <laughs> like dribbles is, what, is what's going to happen. <laughs> well, let's start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. Yeah, you know what? It's our last frame rate of this of the year uh, because of the way the schedule falls. We're on New Year's Eve, we're on Christmas Eve, so we won't have another one until January 7th, uh, which means we have to get in one last Apple rumor. Right, Brian? Well, you sure. Well, and it's not just we, – we sort of have to shoot past the gap, right? We need to – people are going to expect us at the end of the year to make predictions about the upcoming year. So we'll just go ahead and lob this one out there and say that uh, we have another rumor hot off the presses. You're not going to believe this, Tom. I don't know if you, you've heard the scuttlebutt. We're pretty sure Apple's going to make a set-top television. Wait, wait. What? A set-top television? A yeah, television, like television to put on my television? Yes, it's it's the over the top <laughs> television experience. Because <laughs> you ever notice, like you'll watch TV and you'll wish that you were watching something better. This gives you that second experience. It's the Apple TV TV that goes on top of your current television. <laughs> that is a new rumor. I hadn't heard that one before. Uh, no, in all seriousness, the Wall Street Journal reporting this morning, uh, reporting last week, actually last Wednesday, uh, Apple testing out an Apple TV said, "What makes this a different leak and or unconfirmed rumor than the others?" If this is true, 
they are going to Sharp and Foxconn and having them create prototypes. Now, Apple does a lot of their testing in R&D in-house. In fact, most of their testing in R&D. They don't go to external manufacturers until they think they're ready to roll. Uh, it doesn't mean they are ready to roll. It means that they are pretty much done with the internal design and they want to see how it works in an actual plant, uh, which would mean they're confident in the product. But as we've been saying with all these rumors, it comes down to them striking the deals to actually make a set-top box oh, I, or a television that would work. I, I think that's the most disappointing thing about this la latest batch of rumors is that the one thing I truly care about is the user experience. There are plenty of pretty televisions. I mean, I mean, how, how long have we gotten to where where the, the visual experience is pretty well flatlined for the last five years. There's not been, I mean, you might throw 3D in my face, in which case I'll throw acid in your face. But uh, as far as what I care about in the living room experience. <laughs> I'm going it's to like, your 3D I want, theater. I want, I want the, the licensing deals. I want them all to get nice and play ball together so that I can have the same. Like, it, it, it was so brutal today to think of all the ways that I've already paid for Cartoon Network so I could watch regular show in Adventure Time. And I was trying to explain to my brother, like, he had never seen a regular show. And it took me, and it, it took me like 45 minutes till finally I had to go back and find some, like, you know, archived copies that may or may not have come off a of BitTorrent like three years ago before, before I could find something for him. And it's ridiculous. And we've said it on the show over and over and over again. We hate that the current best user experience happens to be the illegal one. And none of us want that to be the case. So where we are going with this is it may be, if this is true, if Wall Street Journal is right, and Wall Street Journal has a pretty good track record on these things, that Apple is, is ready to pull the trigger and they feel confident enough that they can get a deal soon, that they're, they're going to go ahead and get started so that when they do pull the trigger on a content deal, they'll be ready to roll with making actual television sets. Uh, if you want to go farther down that road of speculation, go to allthingsd.com and read Jeremy Allaire's uh, article, All I Want for Christmas is My Apple TV. Jeremy Allaire is the founder and chairman of Bright Cove. He's also the CEO. Uh, and he wrote up basically the ultimate rumor. It's not even a rumor. He's not claiming that, the, that he has any insight. He's like, based on all the stuff we've heard, Here's what I think is going to happen. They made up pictures of what the box would look like, of what the service would look like, uh, how, how it would work. I mean, it's, it is a long and detailed fantasy that, frankly, that right sounds word. plausible. No. You, you nailed it. It is, it is, it, it's worse than a fantasy, Tom. Uh, this is Apple television pornography. This it is. is. It this absolutely is, is. Speculating wildly on this, on this uh, hyperbolic, ex, you know, vision of what we want it to be. It's like they might as well put a pair of tits on the damn thing. Hey, okay, but what he says is, uh, in, in a nutshell, I'm going to leave out a lot of what he says. He's very detailed. Uh, but you will have a TV app the way you have a phone app on the iPhone. And that will give you like the best view ever into your your television service with whomever they partner with whether it's time warner or somebody else uh and then you'll also have a second screen experience if you have an ipad or an iphone where you can control that television with there and you can see a guide and get second screen information but then beyond that you'll have the ultimate game console because they'll make uh, Bluetooth available so you can have third-party controllers to do real serious gaming. Uh, you know, they'll have uh, an app store that will allow you to do, like, honest-to-goodness, you know, first-person shooters, full-on console-type gaming. So they'll be taking on the consoles. And it would have an app store so that you can do all kinds of other appy things on there uh, from, from the obvious, like, oh, I'm going to have that HBO Go app. I'm going to have the, the, the Showtime app. I'm going to have the CW app uh, and watch things that way all the way up to, you know, things like car shopping where you can have the car built on your big screen TV while you pick out all the options is one of the examples he gives. Uh, it sounds pretty, pretty reasonable, I mean, I, none sure. of this is necessarily true or not, but... Uh, no, I mean, all of this, and that's what makes it such a... Sed this is what's so seductive about this techno porn, Tom, is that it sounds... It's just, just as good pornography is set in a location where you can picture sex actually happening. This is set with all the deals that you would... Well, it's reasonable. I totally imagine they could get this handshake deal and integrate all this stuff and make this ecosystem. Sure, why not? And that's why it's so seductive. And that's why... You should get married to your actual. Meanwhile, your actual television is over there overeating because she's scared. She's scared you're going to leave her, Tom. And you need to you need to go love your current television. That's actually one of the interesting her. things that Jeremy posited is that you could actually keep your current television 
And Apple TV would be sold not just as a television, but also as a set-top box. So you and your current television can enjoy this story together. Now, is, is that... I mean, this is... I, it's so damn plausible, but it's like I'm mad at us for even having this conversation. I feel so strung on for so long. Let me ask. Let me ask Jay. Jay, Are you frustrated? You, you, little bits. I'm looking for release, Tom. I just wish there was something that would uh, just be you know release the pressure here for a bit. All right, Jay. How many? How do you watch television? Like you should be the target demographic right. here. Do, uh, you, do you yeah, actually? No, do- I. Uh, uh, me, I do not have cable. I have Hulu Plus, and I have Netflix. And I have piracy. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm sorry to admit that we don't we yeah. don't we don't condone that. That's not what. We, but you no. are the right uh, demographic in that you are a true cord cutter because both Tom and I repeatedly have said that we want to cut the cord uh, for cable television, but we just for various entanglements, usually tied up with our women. Well, uh, it's not well, happened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would I would love to get rid of. Uh, any sort of cable. I just, I would love to, like, I would love to be able to watch The Hobbit in my home today. <laughs> and I can't because of the business models that are in place. And it's just, the whole thing's just obscene. That's like, true. I, yep. I got, like, it might, it might be overreaching asking for The Hobbit right now. But, well, but I, mean, I know what he means, which is like, why, why, you know, if I have enough money, why shouldn't I be able to buy it? Yeah, there has to be some price at which it makes sense, right? So it's like, because like I know that you, Jay, you're not a fan of going to some loud theater. Last time you went and saw the uh, Fellowship of the Rings, you hated it because it was too loud. There was too much annoying people all the, all around. Oh, the Nazgul's and the... Like, it was a like, physically unpleasant experience for you. I, I actually, and I'm not afraid to make this public, I had a panic attack. Because it was too claustrophobic. In, the, in the theater. It, it just made me uncomfortable. And I had to leave, and I left the theater, but I couldn't leave, leave, because I was these guys ride and so you had social entanglements and everything yeah and so i would i drank water and like had uh, you, <laughs> you know, sat there weeping in a corner until finally they found I the was ring like hot tamales like <laughs> and, and that was well, like, you were experiencing what the hobbits felt when they went into mordor it's actually you're just really like taking that <laughs> they just really did a good job of bringing that uh, yeah. that miserable experience to Jay <laughs> that, that fear of the nazgul you felt that well, okay, now how much would you pay for the ability to see The Hobbit at the same time everyone else did, but not, you know, but not in a movie theater? How much more would you pay right now for just you? Like, you couldn't have a hosting party. You couldn't have friends over. It would have to be you paying out of pocket. Me? Yeah. All right. Uh, average price is, what, $12 nowadays? Sure. We'll say, we'll say 20 for the premium IMAX experience. Uh, I would pay $35 yeah, to see, see. it. That's out the, of the it's, it's that we're that close because we've we've out had of the gates like at home that the date came out I would I would totally pay that yeah see and being able to pause and being able to like go pee and like you know refresh my drink and you know uh, popcorn whatnots I mean it. It just, that that just kills me. It kills me. That, that <laughs> it physically it, kills me. I'm like, dead. Like I'm I'm dead. All right. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's always good to get another perspective. Tom. All right, now that you killed your brother, let's move on to another big story. Stop everything! It's another big story. Am I my brother's killer? No. Uh, Nielsen teaming up with Twitter to measure audience reach on social networks. So. It was a, a little confusing when this broke today because uh, Nielsen has their whole net r- rating arm, uh, and then they also have their you know more famous television arm. Uh, this is both. This is going to be TV ratings based on Twitter interaction. So the the best example is you know when there's a presidential debate or the Olympics or a Super Bowl. Obviously, everybody on Twitter is talking about it. So that will cause a rating. Twitter is going to give the fire hose of data to Nielsen. And Nielsen's going to be able to say, this was the most popular television show on Twitter on this day. Uh, I, I don't, and I, when I say this day, I don't know how they're going to break it up by time or whatever. But, but they're going to give ratings of television shows based on 
Twitter activity. And this is all part of the getting advertisers on board with the fact that, hey, when you advertise and we do a Twitter-related campaign with hashtags, it's worth more, and they want to be able to charge appropriately. See, and, and I think there's an inherent conflict of interest in that regard, because uh, one of the things that really made me raise an eyebrow was the fact that this is a multi-year deal. So uh, essentially, uh, Nielsen is not only saying we think that Twitter has the, the, the juice to stick around, and that it's not just a fad and it's not going to go away, in some ways – it's sort of a coronation to, of saying, like, it's a chicken and egg thing, right? It's like, is Twitter the standard by which popularity should be judged? Or is it deals like this that solidify the presence of Twitter? Because on top of that, you know, I've, I've been keeping an eye on the whole clout phenomenon, and I'm astonished at, um, at how the numbers don't seem to add up. Like, like you can have way, way, way more followers. For example, I've got a, a, a lot more followers on Google+, Plus, and it seems like there's a, more engagement over there, but Clout, you know, completely discounts it because of the total number and the nature of the involvement of people on Google+, Plus compared to something like, uh, you know, to Twitter. And on Twitter, it pays attention to how many robot accounts you have. Nowadays, you could buy Twitter accounts on eBay for, I think it's like 20 bucks to get 40,000 followers on there. Uh, and I, unfortunately, in this deal, there's no vested interest for Twitter to try to discourage robots from responding and talking. Yeah, about but but things. this but but that's a false that's a false thing. I mean, there are plenty of other reasons that Twitter wants to discourage that kind of behavior. I mean, that it doesn't no, all hinge on this one deal. I mean, Twitter's, oh, no, Twitter's I, I, main I, I, business isn't this one deal with Niels. No, no, but what I'm saying is across the board, I don't see any reason for Twitter to want to... Well, that's I mean, a whole separate... I, I think you're wrong about that. That's a, that's getting way outside the realm right, of, right, of right. frame rate, I guess, to, to sure. talk about Twitter's management of spam and, and their relevance and, and all of that sort of thing. I also don't think that th those sort of things impact what they're doing here because what, what they're saying isn't about follower count. It isn't about numbers, per se. It's about reach. It's about no, no, saying no, it's, this it's about number activity. of people it's actually it. were talking about this show. Now, Okay, you can have robo posts that just post the you know you know algorithms of of you know, realistic sounding things, but there are ways to detect those and discount those as well. And I know that Twitter applies those in their own metrics, and I, I would presume that Nielsen would go after reducing that as well. That's all about methodology. Do we believe people are good at statistics and algorithm detection or not? To me, what what this boils down to is, if you think Twitter and Nielsen are at least halfway competent, which I think Twitter is. I think Nielsen's probably close to halfway competent most of Closer the time. Closer now that they signed uh, this deal. This is not, and there's some confusion in the chat room, this is not about TV ratings. They're not trying to tell you how many viewers there were. What they're trying to figure out here is, did people talk? Did they watch live in most cases? Did they talk about it? Were they into it? Were they liking it? What was their mood? There's all kinds of great studies where you can tell mood based on Twitter. And what I think is important, you hit upon right out of the gate, which is just Twitter. Nielsen, you know, Nielsen doesn't say, oh, we came out with our TV ratings just based on Samsung televisions. You right. know, they survey all the televisions. doesn't matter. Why is this just Twitter? Is it a start with Twitter and then they'll add in Facebook and Google Plus and others along the way? Because there's a whole lot more people active on Facebook than there are on Twitter. Maybe it's because Twitter is done by default public, and so it's a lot easier to get this data. Whereas Facebook, you have to, you have to approve that data to go. I don't know. Yeah, this seems like the kind of thing that uh, the folks over at Clout should be just hammering. They should be sending out press releases. They should be establishing themselves as the, the authority and say, don't go directly to Twitter. Don't go directly to Facebook. Go to us because we could track uh, the, the influential folks and see whether or not, you know, because and for those exact reasons where it's like you, you want to have somebody with a vested interest in the accuracy of the influence. Yeah, but, of but Nielsen has a vested interest in the accuracy. I mean, they're going to try to do the exact same thing that Clout does only much better. They're going to, they, that's, that's their game. Well, see, I, yeah, well, as you know, I am not very impressed with the Nielsen organization with my one time of filling out a form for them but but right you know, we'll right well, and and there are also uh, all things d in their article points out that data sniff and gnip uh are partners who have privileged access to the api and now nielsen joins that and that has to upset companies like cloud or they mentioned bluefin bluefin actually does uh, uh multi-dimensional rankings and provides the, what they say is rich and actionable multi-dimensional analytics uh, but essentially what they're saying is, this is going to be a Johnny One note from Nielsen. If you want the real full story, talk to us. Right. Uh, so Bluefin is, is on your side there.
Well, and also uh, try this on for size. There could be a, a cord cutters upside to all of this. What happens when Nielsen is tracking which are the most influential, most talked about, most exciting programs on television? And uh, by the very nature of tracking Twitter, you're tracking a more tech savvy audience. And then all of a sudden, what if uh, H plus turns out to be more talked about than, uh, you know, whatever your latest Showtime release is or something like that? I mean, there's tr tremendous upside in well, that they're at least listening to a more connected community. Possibly. Uh, you also have the uh, public radio conundrum. Uh, when public radio becomes the top-rated radio station in the, uh, in the city, it doesn't matter because the advertisers don't buy the book to find out if public radio is the most popular. And a lot of times they're not even listed in Arbitron. Now, we're talking about Arbitron, not Nielsen, because of that fact. This is being sold to advertisers. So, yes, you may be right, because advertisers may be interested in H+. Uh, but my guess is that because it's being sold to advertisers and those advertisers and their agencies work directly with broadcast media, they won't spend a lot of time collecting data on non-traditional television viewing. You know, what, you know what I love about us, Tom? Is that we take turns pooping on each other's dreams. That's <laughs> yes, we do. But you know what we can both agree on? What's that, sir? We got our first freaking Pond 5 movie. Yes, dude, this is amazing. How many times? We, in fact, we, we've been calling for it forever. And then, uh, in fact, I think it was within two or three hours of last week's episode, I got a message over Twitter saying, fine, nobody's going to make you a movie. I've got it for you. Here we go. Can we, can we roll this? This is Now, keep in mind, for those who don't remember, Pond 5 is one of our fabulous sponsors. They provide uh, stock media, video, images, 3D models, all kinds of templates. They got sound effects. They got mu music. It's, it's amazing. Anything you can think of. And they got 50 random clips that are available for free. So if you go well, to It's not 50 random clips. You get 50 no. free stock media files when you go to Pond5.com slash frame rate. That's the right, deal. Yeah, but they but they they pick them for you. The the, the fifty are and, and I've got a lot of traffic on this on Twitter. Uh, the, the the fifty are random are random picks that you're able to just take and run with it. Uh, as as I understand the deal. So this guy went and took these random clips and put together this gorgeous little vignette. I'm not going to spoil the ending and say what. In a about. world where crazy copyright laws have made everyone go <laughs> crazy. When nighttime has learned to become daytime. <laughs> when popular landmarks have been completely abandoned. When clouds have learned to move at double speed. And when even birds have begun to flee the earth. Brian Brushwood and Tom Merritt are on a quest to save the world. Their quest's name, Frame Rate. Every Monday on the Twitch Network. Watch it and help them save the world. It actually makes me want to watch Frame Rate now. I tell you, up until this, I used to think this is a terrible show we did. But now I'm a believer. I think this is a fantastic <laughs> show. We owe it all to the slick marketing of uh, who was that that sent that into us? Um, I believe that was Richard. 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 Yeah, Richard Coat. Richard Coat. 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 I had given up on life. He did not provide a pronunciation. <laughs> Jay says he's, he had given up on life, and then that uh, changed it's everything a, it, for it, him. It turned everything around. I just <laughs> so there you go, folks. Get your fifty free clips, and just and make the world a better place. Also, if you're an artist, you can upload uh, your stock media and sell it at, at industry leading rates. Artists selling on top, Pond Five get control over the pricing. Uh, and you get fifty percent royalties for each and every sale. So there is no reason not to check it out. Help us to help you go to Pond5, P-O-N-D, the number 5.com slash frame rate to get those 50 free stock media files uh, and let them know you support frame rate just like they do. We thank them for their support. Shall we move into the slipstream? I guess I have my answer. Yes. I was, I was gonna, it's, I can't say no, can I? There's <laughs> can't this, now. Uh, Hulu just released a number of new stats for 2012, including uh, a $695 million revenue figure. Hulu making money up 65% from last year. 
65 year over year growth is phenomenal. And this is the kind of thing that I have to wonder Hulu's best play for all the talk about it being acquired, for having it be, you know, going different directions. Quietly, if it can maintain this kind of growth, this could be the industry industry changing platform that uh, just sneak it up just by virtue of continuing to do what they do as long as they don't break it. Three million paying Hulu Plus subscribers. We're one. Jay, I'm, do- I'm one. Yeah. No, no, I totally uh, like I love the fact that I don't have to have cable and I get all the good TV shows. Now, what, what do you watch your stuff on? Do you watch it on uh, on your iPad or on your home television or what? Mm, iPad, PS3, Xbox. I mean, it depends on wherever I am at the moment. I mean, and you don't I, feel gypped because like Tom, Tom is annoyed that people are paying to essentially get the same content just on a different device. My whole thing is that I don't have to get paid to get the content over regular air. So like, to you, to you, like because you don't have because you don't have a cable bill, all of a sudden that's a big ass budget to play with to exactly, get it all the other ways. Exactly, right. and 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 the the other thing is is that I like the mobility of it. Like I have literally uh, been in my room watching something on Hulu Plus, hopped on my iPad. While I'm on the toilet or whatever, <laughs> and then gone to get a cheesesteak and just resume the whole time. Yeah, just while I'm eating the cheesesteak, I'm watching Hulu, like, you know, and uh, it's the same show the entire time. Right on. And much, I love much it. Much like this show, Tom. Yes, yeah, so, uh, which means that we have to talk about Amazon uh, streaming because they just added a few more uh, of the exclusive. Time Warner. You know, Time Warner's Jeff Books. He likes to talk a lot about Netflix. Sometimes he talks trash, compares them to declining empires. Other times he's like, I'll take their money. Uh, but he's definitely taking Amazon's money. Amazon Prime customers now get The Closer and TNT's Falling Skies. Now, they call the Falling Skies episodes current, although you don't get the current season of Falling Skies until three months after they air. But, but still, you're, you're getting some TV shows on Amazon Prime now that you cannot get on Netflix. Yeah, I, have we had a story like this before? I can't remember another another major title that was going to be only on Amazon Prime, not well, on the Netflix. West Wing and Fringe uh, are other Time Warner shows that are available on Amazon Prime, and some of which are exclusive. Okay, well, so, that's good. That's, yeah. and again, like the, the more players in this market, the better. Better, and it's like there there have been times I may have called Amazon Prime the RC Cola of the great uh, uh, cord cutters competition, but. You know what? Keep doing this. Did you say more players, Brian? Because Verizon's uh, teaming up with Redbox for the Redbox Instant service, which is now available in beta. Redbox Instant by Verizon. We've we've talked about the rumor before, but it's for real now. Uh, $8 a month gets you streaming movies and the ability to rent up to four DVDs a month from Redbox kiosks. If you're like, I don't want Redbox kiosks, it's only $6 a month for the streaming. Or if you want Blu-ray in your Redbox kiosk uh, rentals, that's $9 a month. So a little different pricing plan, a little bit cheaper than Netflix in, in one way, uh, a little bit more expensive in another. It all depends on how you look at it. Mostly it's cheaper though, really. I mean, because if you consider if you want DVDs from Netflix and streaming, you got to pay like $14. So sure, sure. Uh, this is, again, uh, in, a, in, a be- in a public beta that you have to be allowed into, and they will launch it for reels after the first of the year. They don't have a deal with Disney yet, but remember, Netflix is getting that exclusive deal with Disney coming up. Otherwise, they, they seem to have all of the main deals that you would ex- want to have in a streaming service, at least these days. Yeah, man, it's so easy. I just want to, I'm not a fan of the Redbox experience, so if there's part of me that wants to, you know, sort of harp on them for being so late to this party. But meanwhile, they, yeah, we need more racers in this in this marathon. So welcome. We're glad you're competing. Thank you very much, Redbox. Now hurry up and get out of beta and launch the service so that we can make other people hustle even harder. Now, we also talk a lot about signposts along the road. Uh, to the inevitable transition of television to being delivered well, over the you, internet. I think you meant just like the two of us in general. As we travel across these United yes. States, we will often stop and Instagram photos of signposts along the road. Both of these things are true, but in this case, I'm talking about the signpost that indicates that Aereo's business model is progressing. Aereo, if you don't know, the service that gives you broadcast television over the internet by taking a, a micro array of antennas. So they say each person gets their own antenna 
We're not rebroadcasting. We're just a long extension cord to the antenna. So they give you all the free over-the-air broadcasts over the Internet in New York City right now. They're limited to New York. They're also fighting a court case over this. But they have added their first cable channel. They are paying Bloomberg TV to send Bloomberg television over the internet along with the free over the air channels. Now, here's where I think this gets really interesting. Now that they've got Bloomberg on board, and Bloomberg's a likely candidate because Bloomberg's kind of uh, coming from behind in the race for, for television news. Uh, they do a lot of this sort of thing where other companies won't take the chance yet. I, I think that the play Ariel needs to make is you go to the big broadcasters and you say, look, you can try to sue us out of existence. You can waste a lot of money in court. Or you can pay us, or we can pay you to carry your cable channels. Stop fighting us over NBC, ABC, CBS broadcast television, which is your dying breed anyway. And we will pay you for Bravo, NBC. We will pay you for ABC Family. We will pay you for Fox News Channel. Look, we're paying Bloomberg. It's not we're adverse to paying. So, okay, so uh, in, in this regard, like... Previously, whenever we talked about Ariel, we talked about how this was kind of like the perfect test case because it obeyed in every way the letter of the law while still bringing the stream content anywhere, anytime experience that users actually want. And it sort of was this very cut and dried example case. Does adding this sort of muddy the waters and make Aereo into more of like, well, I don't know, why are you, are you a cable provider? And what's your business model? And just because you got some antennas, you think you can rebroadcast uh, these other stations? Like no, I actually I think it helps their, their, uh, their argument in that way because what, what, what you're seeing is the fact that they're saying, okay, cable television actually has must-carry law, right? In other words, sure. I have to carry the over-the-air channels. So look, we're just, we're like that. We're, we're taking a free over-the-air service. We're not being a cable rebroadcaster. Uh, we're, we're doing an antenna service, but we also have this other service. We're, we're a new breed. I don't think it undermines their case because they're, they're very clearly saying these things are free over-the-air. We're providing that. Just, just like DirecTV selling you an antenna that you stick onto the satellite dish before the days that when they were allowed to carry uh, local channels. It's, sure. I, I, I don't think it undermines their case too much. A sure. and E yeah. history and lifetime launching iPad apps uh, with full episodes. Lifetime, even if you like those lifetime movies, Jay Brushwood, I know you like those lifetime <laughs> movies. I love them. Yeah, they're my favorite. <laughs> Sally Field. I can't get enough. You can get them on your iPad now, and in fact, uh, twenty-five full-length movies there. You also get extra content and more uh, more features if you're a Comcast Xfinity subscriber. So they're adding in that sort of like. It is an interesting hybrid. They're saying, we're going to do like CW. We're going to put an app out there that's ad-supported, and you can watch the stuff for free. But if you want full seasons of back episodes, just authenticate as a cable television subscriber. So, okay, so out of all the stories that we got, this last one here is the one that was toughest for me to wrap my mind around. I'm hoping that you can kind of explain it to me. Uh, the, the headline reads, Fora TV, it says, Netflix for nerds. Fora.tv launches conference and event video subscriptions. What, what exactly is this, Tom? Okay, so think of it as TED Talks, right? Because okay. these are not TED Talks, but that's the easiest one for people who don't consume this kind of video to wrap their head around. Informative. Sure conference videos from a conference you didn't get to attend, but you're very interested in the topic. People pay lots of money for this stuff, especially in, in niche industries, right? You work in uh, aerospace technology, or, or you work in sales and marketing, or, or you, you work in uh, you know, infrastructure management. You, you pay a lot of money to go to these conferences, and if you can't make it to the conferences, you may pay up to $100 to watch this video and see this seminar because it's groundbreaking information in the scientific community. There's all kinds of um, amazing stuff that you need to see to keep up on what's happening in your industry. So what Fora is doing is saying, instead of having to fly to a conference or maybe pay a really large fee to get this video right after, we're going to charge you $100 a year or $10 a month, and you get access to everything 90 days after it happens. Now, this is amazing because this is the kind of thing like people were sp spending that same $100 for a crappy VHS copy of what was just one 
camera set up in the back of an auditorium at these niche conventions. You know, in the world of magic, you've got, uh, you know, dozens of regional magic conventions. You've got a couple of na- nationwide ones. And every couple of years, you have their big FISM, which is like the Olympics of magic. Uh, recently, like two years ago, a group of magicians got together and said, why don't we do TED Talks, but all for magic? Super high production values. It'll be, we'll call it the first virtual digital conference. Uh, and the price was affordable. I think it was like $100 per person. And you got to see these world-class magicians give you their full attention. They took questions over, over the internet. I think we're going to see more and more virtualization. There will be a little bit of networking demand to be there in person. But by and large, if what you care about is accessing the expertise of these individuals, uh, why would you spend over $1,000 to move your physical meat over to a certain space just so you could be in a crappy Holiday Inn in Des Moines, Iowa, whereas uh, where you could get that same information at such a reduced rate? I'm very excited about this kind of thing. Do they, Jay, do they do the same thing for animation? Absolutely. Uh, There are tons of websites that that have uh tutorials and you know uh where there are hundreds of dollars to to download these workshops and um yeah it's like something like this that just exposes things more and more is just awesome for everybody yeah i agree with, i agree with what you guys are saying uh i would just just in all fairness brian the holiday inn in des moines has improved quite a bit uh, oh, you would. You're such an apologist for the Holiday Inn in Des Moines. This is why we always come back to this hotel, don't we, sir? <laughs> Look, they really cleaned up. It was just that one time. It was an old pair of sheets. They replaced <laughs> them fast. Okay, I've, we're going to run into trouble if we don't move on. <laughs> Let's here. move on to Tube Tops. <laughs> Calm has gone into effect. Brian, do you feel it? I, I, you know what? I do feel it. I feel like all of a sudden it's the thousand, it's the sound of a thousand screaming advertisers suddenly gone silent. The I feel like something very terrible has happened. The Commercial Advertisement Loudness Mitigation Act, because Congress is good at one thing, it's an acronym, uh, officially went into effect. Uh, ads and promos are now required to remain on par with the average audio levels of scheduled programming. Previously, if I have this right, and I, I wish I would have dug a little farther to find this, I think there was previously a re, either a regulation or a law that said that ads couldn't exceed a certain level, but it didn't have to stay at the same level as the rest of the programming. So what Calm is doing is saying, look, if the average level of a program is this, then the average level of the commercial has to be that as well. Now, the Internet has no rule like that. So pond5.com slash frame rate... <laughs> <laughs> no, um. uh, no, I believe it says here that uh, that the FC and, and this is, you know, for, uh, forgive me for saying so, but it seems like Congress is awfully good at legislating that which is already happening on its own. And it does, the article does mention that uh, that complaints about loud advertisements have diminished since 2009, which this article is quick to point out coincides awfully close to the death of Billy Mays. Uh, but uh, I, I, think, I, mean, I, look, I, I didn't write it. I thought that was, you know, yeah. he does shout a lot. Right, he did. Uh, but the, uh, you know, he doesn't uh, shout anymore, does he? I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to watch your stupid commercials anyway. Uh, Xbox Live getting a bunch of new stuff. 40 other apps lined up along with MTV and Flickster. Uh, Major Nelson announcing that last week. And then also uh, today, it's like Major Nelson's like, I got got announcements every week. Uh, Xbox Live adding smart glass support for ESPN and NBA Game Time, as well as a new sports pick app. Uh, that lets you compete against friends to see who's best at guessing UFC events, NBA games, and college football. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, it's. Uh, yeah, I just wish I cared more about sports ball because it seems like it's a really good time to be into that stuff. What about yeah, that now, MTV it, app, though? Huh? Uh, well, dude, if, what? if only it was had anything to do with music television. HBO then, Nordic. Um, Come into the Xbox. Skip, we're not Look, in man, they'll, get, they'll get to the geeks and wizards soon enough, man. We'll make this happen. All right. Uh, and Kaleidoscape is also something that neither one of us have any direct experience with because what does it cost? Uh, $12,500. Uh, but it had been in legal trouble because what Kaleidoscape did was took your Blu-ray discs or your DVD discs and stored them on a high-end media server, bit-for-bit copies, so that you could easily stream the Blu-rays you owned in high definition to your amazingly expensive home theater setup. Uh, what's interesting is they haven't resolved all these legal troubles yet, but they've been able to strike a deal uh, with several movie companies to do digital sales of high-level 
movies. So you're, you'll be able to get Blu-ray level quality movies uh, and download them from Kaleidoscape to this media server. They're even talking about coming out with a cheaper version, Brian, only $3,000. I'll tell you what, man, this is the kind of thing you and I have talked about this in the past, how uh, I honestly think a lot of the talk about DRM, a lot of the posturing for legal and for SOPA and all this stuff, in so many ways, it's all a red herring. Everybody who runs all of these media companies knows that the digital change is coming, that the direct customer models coming. Uh, what they're doing is they're buying time and they're buying times for, for deals like this to actually happen. I mean, we just talked to Jay who wants to spend twice, three times as much for a movie if he could do it and, and do it at home. So once, I mean, to be honest, $3,000, if I could watch first run movies and there was a totally DRM secure, and, and again, I don't love DRM, but if there's like a VPN private channel to where I can watch these movies one time show uh, in, in my home and didn't have to go anywhere, I already spend like $100 plus every time I go to the movie theater just because I don't want to go anywhere besides the Alamo Draft House. Spending $100 for me and the missus to watch that same movie in the comfort of our home, thanks to something like this, would be very possible. And Kaleidoscape is uh, part of Ultraviolet now as well, which means when you buy that high-end version, when you pay all that extra money to get that, that really quality version from, a, of a, like, say, a Time Warner movie, you'll also get access to it on your mobile devices if Ultraviolet ends up working that the way they want ultraviolet to work. Let's move yep. on to film fact. A new Star Trek Into Darkness trailer is out. Uh, it came out this weekend, played before The Hobbit. Also, nine minutes, the first nine minutes of the movie played before The Hobbit, uh, HFR. And... Shot-by-shot shot breakdown of the new trailer on io9 is probably one of the best things I've seen in a long time. Like, really getting into the nitty-gritty of what you're seeing in each and every one of these scenes. Uh, I saw you guys uh, giving the thumbs up there. Did you, did you see either and or the trailer or the first nine minutes? I did. I did not see the first nine minutes, but I know you did. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. We'll 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 get your breakdown. I don't know. Does that belong in the spoiler zone, or can we talk about it now? It's just. A I can talk about it non-spoilery. I, okay. I, I, there's no reason for me to spoil those first nine minutes to give you my opinion, okay. which was this. this. The, okay, yeah, go ahead and tell me, and I'll tell you. I, I do Real quick, though, I do have one opinion about this thing. It looks like they're trying to hit so many of the same notes of what we loved about the Wrath of Khan, possibly to a fault, because coming up here in just a moment, you're about to see that, that iconic moment when Kirk and Spock both put their hands up on the glass uh, at the end of Wrath of Khan 2, there's an there's I don't know if it's a nod to that or what, but it kind of concerns me because in the case of the Wrath of Khan, it was the poignant, heartbreaking end of a 30 year friendship. Whereas this, we just saw them a movie where they hated each other. Now all of a sudden, if they try to tug my heartstrings like that, that ain't gonna work unless that's not Kirk's hand. In which case, that could be very poignant. Well, it's probably a Hura's hand. No. Oh, you no, think? Probably not. Well, I don't know. It looked like, oh, shoot, was it? Well, thought... they ha we saw this scene last week. Why th Did you not notice it at the end of the Japanese version of the trailer? The last? hand on the glass? No, I didn't Yeah, notice. that was the whole thing about the Japanese trailer is that, oh, yeah. There, no, there it is. There that's, it is. There that's, it is. Uh, that's Benedict Cumberbatch's hand. Mm, Sherlock, dude. You think? Yeah. I don't know. Yep. Huh. All uh, right, we'll see. So my impressions of the first nine minutes, the same smile I had on my face the entire time I saw the Avengers movie was on my face for nine minutes. That's awesome. That is like, you have no idea how happy you just made the it's brush my, with it, It's like nine <laughs> thumbs up. It is awesome. I love it. Thank I, you. Um, and my wife, Eileen, is a huge fan of this J.J. Abrams uh, reboot. She was so excited. She, I wanted to see the HFR IMAX, and she's like, yes, we have to see the IMAX because of the nine-minute trailer. I'm like, well, well, yes, of course, absolutely. She's like, but we're going to be able to see the nine minutes at the thing you want to go to, right? Because I got to see the nine minutes. I'm like, yes, yes, we're going to see we got there. We're in a, an assigned seats place. People don't show up until the last minute when you have assigned seats at a theater because sure. they're like, ah, it's just, it's just the trailer. It's no big deal. She was like about to kill a guy. She was gonna she was gonna cut because there was a guy. There were two guys walked in front of her during during the first time <laughs> doing their show Dude, the Star Trek. I'll tell you what, you, you know that that that, uh, and I'm sure this would have been covered. Uh, Alamo Draft House will not seat you after the feature starts. They're like, sorry, you, you're just gonna go home. Maybe we'll refund your money or something. Anyway, it was she. She 100% agreed with me. She was like, "That looks amazing," 
And there's oh, a cliffhanger. So there's a cliffhanger at the end of the freaking nine minutes. So, so you don't feel like anything was taken away. Your enthusiasm is, you're so excited to rewatch that nine minutes when the movie oh, comes yeah. out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I want to watch, I want to rewatch that nine minutes a couple times before I go see the movie and then watch it and see what happens after the nine minutes. Amazing. Awesome, it's awesome, awesome. Like my nerd brain is just like, <laughs> love it. Thank you, J.J. Abrams, for making something awesome and now relevant. Yeah. Uh, I love you. Now, That's Pacific awesome. Rim is Guillermo del Toro's uh, big giant monsters versus big giant robots movie, and the first trailer for that came out this past week. Did you get a chance to look at that? I've not seen this at all. Jay, did oh. you catch this? Oh, I haven't seen this at all. It looks, visuals look awesome as always. It's, it, it's, it's a, um, you, you, you gotta watch it again after we're done with the show so you don't have me chabbering in your ear uh, while you watch it. But really, I mean, big giant robots, big giant creatures beating each other up. Okay, so essentially, this is great how we've got to come full circle back to the 1950s uh, Gojira. This is awesome. Yeah, it looks Gojira. really well done. <laughs> you guys are just going to, you're like, uh... Sorry, I'm just watching it. Gojira, <laughs> drool, big monsters. Uh, what was the this guy, is- the Ultraman, like he... Grew 50 feet. Yeah, and, and his yeah. knockoff Spectre Man. Uh, yeah, dude, we're just sitting here with beatific smiles. As You got to take this off. I'll watch it after the show. This looks amazing. All right. Uh, uh, more good news uh, in the film foul world of things to watch. Uh, Netflix has expanded their order for Arrested Development. Uh, they had ordered 10 episodes. They now have expanded that to between 12 and 15 episodes. And again, so- when they debut the new season, all of the episodes get posted at once. I had the best experience reading this because I was going through uh, Google News, right? You never know what to, this is what I love about Google News is that it's all algorithm based. So it's like you read from sources that you wouldn't normally read and, you, and it's not necessarily relevant to you. It's just what's popular. But I, I just go along and the headline reads, uh, production stops on arrested development. I'm like, oh! it's like, because they're adding five more episodes. I'm like, yeah. What a horrible headline. Yeah. It, it, it was a funny headline for that. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the NSFW show. Frame rate, win a movie draft. Who will lose? Ace Detect. Wait, I just noticed that in the graphic. Why is it at my name after who will lose? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. It's tighter than ever right now because, okay, so I'm, I'm calling it up right now. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Tom. The Hobbit had the largest week, single weekend release in all of December history, beating out a bunch of the other ones. However, $84 million in opening weekend. Now it all comes down to the week over weeks. Like, it really is going to be, uh, I mean, uh, where, that, where am that I? That just barely got me out of last place, that $84 okay, yes. million. Dollars. Yeah. So right now, I have pretty much dead on the nose a $200 million lead over you. Now, here's the real bummer is you had the number one and number two best box office I drawing movies. I don't think that's a bummer. That's, a, that's awesome. Okay, it was a bummer for me oh, because, right. I, because I was hoping that Lincoln was, would continue to pull in some bucks, and, and it has. Uh, Lincoln was in third place. The question is, if Lincoln can keep making money week over week, if I can squeeze out another 20 or $30 million out of Lincoln and Wreck-It Ralph put together, I got a chance. But this thing, this thing's going to come down to the wire. This is yeah. going to be the closest draft we've ever had. And I, I would still not count out. I would still not count out Le Miserable. I'm sorry, Le Miserable. No, no, Le, less, less Le, Miserable. No. You got an email correcting you. you don't, no, you don't say the S. It's, it's no. not, I've been saying La, which, which is wrong. With the S, you say Le. Less. I believe that's what that email was, was trying to point out. Fair enough. I don't think you, you say the S. What, what's I your don't gut speak gut? French, gonna, though. Are you going to walk away with this? Huh? I, does your gut tell you you're going to win? No. My gut tells me I'm going to lose. What? My gut tells me that, that The Hobbit is uh, going to suffer from a little bit of muttering about, eh, it wasn't great, and that uh, I'm, I'm going to fall short. Oh, my God. I hope so. <laughs> 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 Let's move on to what we're watching. <laughs> watching so obviously i did see the uh the hobbit because i talked about that just now and also the star trek uh into darkness first nine minutes uh you didn't get out to the theater this weekend though huh no not at all turns out we're having a baby tomorrow tomorrow we're having the baby we have an appointment at 8 a.m i'll uh, i'll be live tweeting it and we'll let you guys know how everything goes uh but we did watch a whole bunch of always sunny in philadelphia and uh thanks to you tom i am 
far into the black hole of Archer. Archer just gets funnier and funnier and more brilliant and more shocking. It's amazing. The only problem with Archer is that they only have three seasons so far. So you, you yeah, have well, to saw- stop watching at some point. But the new season starts next month, I think, Yeah, no, right? I know. And so we don't have too much longer to wait to get more Archer. But then you have to wait one every week? Yeah, kind of a you and I get 20th century it. thing is that? Yeah, that's it. But then you and I get to talk about it every that's week. True. And that'll be fun. That'll be fun. That'll, be, that'll absolutely be fun. Uh, I've also been watching Homeland on the Showtime app. Uh, because we, we subscribed to Showtime. And I was this is one of those situations where I'm like, you know, I want to watch Homeland. I want to see what this is about. I don't want to set up a season pass and try to catch the old episodes. So I just went right to the app, started watching it on my iPad, and, uh, and then airplaying it to the television when I want to watch it on the big screen. And it was awesome. Well, I, I assume the experience was awesome, but was the... Yeah, the, 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 show, the show's too. good. I, 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 you know how when I watched The Wire, I was like, no, that's hooked from the beginning. And you're like, yeah, a lot of people take a while to get into it. I'm feeling that with Homeland, where it's like, I can see that it's good, but it's taking a while to really pull me in. Every episode pulls me in a little more, though. Right. So, awesome. I'm yeah. sorry that somebody just from the chat room blew my mind out because this hot off the presses came out on Thursday. Apparently, they're doing an Archer live tour coming to your danger zone with, with uh, the actual uh, H. John Benjamin, oh. Aisha Tyler, Chris Parnell, Jessica Walter. This is How amazing would this be? That is how you get ants. At the Fillmore. Oh, my God. It's January 4th at the Fillmore. January 3rd at the Echoplex. That's the day I drive down to Los Angeles. It's the worst timing ever. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, we got we to make this happen. We got to figure out some a... way to get you there. All right, we'll, 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 we'll work on this. Uh, meanwhile, oh, one, one last thing. The Hobbit. Uh, I will say, if I haven't said this already, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, It is a great Lord of the Rings universe movie by Peter Jackson. It has moments of brilliance. Uh, The acting is fantastic and phenomenal. The HFR will strike you weird sometimes because you're trained to associate that with television and documentaries. Uh, But there are other times when the HFR just works and you're like, that is the prettiest thing I have ever seen on a screen. Like as far as a visual life. treat, better than yeah. better than Avatar? Like it, it pops oh, better? At times. But it's not as consistent as Avatar. That's the thing. But yeah, at times, certain of those sweeping vistas, you're like, that's incredible. Oh, that's what HFR gets me. Okay, I'll get used to the kind of, the, the weird, too realistic look. But it never looks like you can see the strings or anything like that. Right. Uh, Plot-wise... Do, do you feel like... Do you feel like it's just culturally we're just trained yeah. to expect? I really do. I really do. And it's involuntary. Like, I was trying to fight against it, and I'm like, nah, it still just looks cheap to me. Uh, but I really do feel it. But I, looked, I would look closely, and I'd be like, yeah, but it, it's not like anything there looks fake. I'm just associating that high of a frame rate with that kind of cultural milieu. Story-wise, it's not The Hobbit. I mean, Ugh. The Hobbit is in there. It's inspired by The Hobbit. Uh, and it's a great story, and it's a fun story to watch, and it definitely feels like Tolkien. Uh, but if you just read The Hobbit like I did, yeah, and you want that, you're still gonna want that. Yeah, you're still gonna want that book as a movie, and that's not what this is. Oh well. That's- Hopefully nobody see it, and then all. <laughs> <we're gonna draft. laughs> Let's finish up with some feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Ashley Brower Whitney uh, said, hey, Frame Rate, caught up on the last few episodes today and decided to check out Sherlock on Netflix, The Rave Review. Only 10 minutes into episode one, and I see what you mean. It's a shame. I really did like Elementary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, if you haven't figured it out, the, uh, the subject of the email says, you guys ruined Elementary for me. I'm uh, watching Sherlock. Also, I want to throw in, we got several people uh, on Twitter, on Google Plus uh, and, and by email, who uh, corrected me, fringe not in a mid-season finale uh, at all. I, to- I totally had that wrong. Uh, in fact, their last episode, and I, I should have known this, I, uh, is coming up in January. So they're just steaming ahead uh, and finishing up the last season by, by January. 
Yeah, and also we got a bunch of people giving their reviews on the HFR experience for The Hobbit. And uh, this one had a different perspective I thought was interesting. He says, uh, this is uh, Scott Duncan says, So I went to go see The Hobbit in real 3D HFR this weekend with my girlfriend. We both enjoyed it a lot. It was sharp and smooth and bright. Reminded me a lot of a well-rendered video game on a high-end graphics card on a PC. Most gamers expect around 60 frames per second performance. So gamers are used to the higher frame rates, which again kind of speaks to what you were saying is that it's just a cultural thing that we associate 24 frames per second with moviness and that maybe this whole new generation will come in and be like, maybe we're old men now because we expect movies to look like movies. Yeah, well, and, and honestly, like, no, all joking aside, people felt this way about color. Some of the reviews of, of, uh, uh, of Wizard of Oz complained about the switch to color. They're like, oh, it looks so good in the black and white parts, and then it just, just looked cheap and tawdry when, when they changed it to color. It's, it's, it's just an association. I don't oh. think it's an intrinsic thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Jay's blushing with excitement. Uh, He's just, like, oh, my. Oh, it's, just, oh, it's terrible. I can see her stockings oh. now. Oh, my. It's just un- it's not done. Uh, we also got Lisa wrote in uh, and uh, pointed out that the new design of YouTube is great, but her issue with YouTube is that you subscribe to a channel instead of a show. I subscribe to several different channels, Geek and Sundry, Nerdist, Machinima Prime, Twit, etc. But in reality, I only like to watch a few shows on each channel. I want to be able to easily choose the shows I like to watch and have them pop out automatically in my feed when new episodes come out. In other words, I'd love to have a Hulu-like experience in YouTube. So if I miss a week of the Guild, the next time I go to my YouTube page, there it is waiting for me. Right now, I get this running list of all content from all my channels and I have to wade through it to find my favorite shows. Yeah, it's uh, this is an interesting thing for them to suss out. And, and you're right in that Hulu and YouTube have very different attitudes. YouTube wants to take on the very nature of broadcast television and they want each channel to be like a, what we think of as a channel, you know, a broadcast medium with a brand that means a certain type and quality of production. Whereas Hulu says you just want the thing. So here's a great and easy way to subscribe and get the things. And it'll be interesting to see if Hulu compromises or if they stick with their vision. I think they're going to stick with their vision. I think you're going to continue to see channels pushed because they want to fundamentally, you know, destroy the way we think of channels in traditional media television. Yeah, but you know what? My my experience in internet content has always been make the stuff available in as many places as possible. Let the users decide where they want to consume your content because they have control. And whenever you try to limit that to trick them into consuming it one way because it's better for your current ad model, it doesn't work out in the long run. So I see this as kind of making that mistake of like, no, but we want people to enjoy the whole channel and get exposed to everything on the channel. And that's great. I understand why. I mean, I'm one of those shows, Sword and Laser on Geek and Sundry, that benefits from people coming for the guild and discovering my show, but I don't think if that's all you want is the guild or all you want is tabletop, you should have that choice to be able to do that. And channel operators should have the choice to limit that or not, based on how maybe maybe they have a particular reason why limiting that does work for them. And and so a channel operator ought to have the choice to say, like, no, I, I would like to allow people to subscribe show by show or channel by channel. I guess what YouTube would say is, well, if you if you want to create multiple channels, you can. Uh, right. So, so go ahead and do that. There's nothing stopping you. Uh, but the, when you start to get into partnerships and stuff, that's that's where the rules start to change and get a little weird. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, man, I guess that's it for this episode of Frame Rate, man. Good time hanging out. And I guess enjoy two weeks off. I'll see you next year sometime. Yeah. No, that, it'll be uh, it'll be 2013, and I'll be in Los Angeles the next time we talk. Wow. Well, we'll all be dead by then. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm sorry. Because, uh, well, and, and, and the world is ending on Friday. Jay, that's my name for I heaven. I know this. <laughs> LA is your it's, name a, it's a metaphor. I'm going to Los Angeles. Uh, you know, yeah, the that, angels. I'll have, uh, I'll have another kid next time we talk. Wow, that's right. Yeah, 24 hours. Um, and I guess I should point out, uh, since we, we got a little bit time before we wrap up, uh, if, if you were wanting to get scam packs, we're down to our last 15 of them. We got 15, and if you order in the next hour, I sound like a freaking commercial, but like literally, today is the 17th. <laughs> My brother is standing by. 
Jilly May is here. Like, <laughs> you get real loud. You're like, Brian's got scam facts. Uh, no, but but John Tilton literally told me before I went on, he was like, let people know if they order by 7 o'clock today, we'll definitely send it out tomorrow, and uh, you'll have it by Christmas. So that's the last. And uh, we, we went through, this has been an amazing experience. We went through 600 scam packs and uh, over 800 individual orders. Uh, it worked out perfectly. I was able to stay home this entire time, work my ass off out of the garage, and uh, and send all these things out. And so now we, we we did well enough that I could stay home and be with the baby and uh, sort of switch over to to kid mode for the next few weeks. I'm way, I'm way excited. That's fantastic, man. And, and in all seriousness, huge congratulations to you and Bonnie. Congratulations. Thank you, you guys. so much, man. We're way excited. Yeah, you should be. And uh, Jay Brushwood, a, a, an unexpected pleasure. Thanks for hanging out with us, man. Hey, awesome. thanks for uh, having me on. That's awesome. You can find us on the interwebs at twit.tv slash fr. We record live most Mondays, although the next two Mondays are an exception, uh, at 3 p.m. or 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. And, of course, email us frame rate at twit.tv. We'll see you next year, everybody. Bye. Pacific Rim looks amazing. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> oh my god, I was unprepared for that. It's like, uh, how did I? How was this not on my radar, man? That's amazing.